Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's 7.30. Please allow me to call to order the Tuesday, May 5th, 2015 meeting of the Merrimack Planning Board. Uh, let me remind everyone that will address the board today to sign in and make sure the microphone's turned on and speak clearly into it so the folks at home can hear you. Our next planning board meeting will be May 19th at 7.30 p.m. in this room. Um, let me appoint Nelson to fill the vacant full position on the planning board to be a voting member tonight. Um, Jeff, we welcomed last time. Tonight we have Councillor Mahon is a uh, representative of the town council and replaces Councillor Koenig as our regularly designated member. Welcome and thank you. Welcome back and thank you for coming. Jillian, that brings us to Mr. planning Chairman, and voting Mr. Chairman, could I interrupt report. for a second? Sure. You, you can also appoint Jeff because Mike isn't here. I, I, let's do that. Uh, we'll appoint Jeff to sit in Mike's spot until we get Mike here. Mike is on his way. but. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Jillian. Yep, uh, we have one regional impact uh, determination for 526 DW LLC vault motor storage site plan. Um, this is a project that proposes a 44,000 square foot commercial storage building located at 526 Daniel Webster Highway in the C2 and Aquifer Conservation Districts and Wellhead Protection 100 and 500 uh, year flood hazard areas. Um, it would, uh, the pr it proposes to construct a new 44,000 square foot commercial storage building behind the existing vault motor storage facility, uh, formerly Xylas. Okay. And uh, the staff's recommendation is that this uh, project is not of regional impact um, as it does not meet the criteria that were discussed by the board on December 2nd, 2014. Thank you for the presentation, Jillian. Um, are they um, all filled up in the buildings they've got? I, I mean, I know it's not, not a criteria sure. for approving their project, but I'm just yeah. curious if we know that. I haven't heard. We haven't okay. mentioned it. Uh, is there any discussion by the board with respect to the regional impact recommendation for 526 DWLLC? Do you want a motion? Yes, please. If I make a, a motion that we accept the staff's recommendation that this will not be a project that is of regional impact. Is there a second for I'll that second motion? I'll second that. Second by Desiree. Uh, now that Mike's here, he can vote in this one instead of Jeff. So all in favor of the motion to find that their DW, the 526 DW highway project is not of regional impact, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? 700 for the regional impact. Julian, is there anything else as a part of the planning and zoning administrator's report? That was all for tonight. Okay. Thank you. Any questions by staff for, uh, any question by the board for members of staff? Seeing none, that brings us to item three on our agenda, which is our annual meeting for election of officers and review of bylaws. Uh, what's the will of the board in terms of what to do first, bylaws or officers? Officers. Officers, Nelson suggests officers. Are there any nominations for the officers of the board? Nelson. I would like to nominate uh, Robert Best for chairman. We could do both at once if you want, and uh, Alistair Milnes to be the secretary for the next year. I'll second. Okay. Nominations don't require a second, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other nominations for officers for the board? Um, before we vote, uh, thank you for the vote of confidence, and I'm glad to uh, serve again if that's what the will of the board is. I uh, I'm proud to comment. represent the group and we thank you, for the honor. Mr. Chair. And I'll echo that comment. If uh, there's nobody else wants the job, I'll be very willing to continue. <laughs> there we go. Uh, if there are no other nominations, all in favor of the nominated slate, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Chairman and Secretary abstaining. Five zero zero for that election. Um, the staff has prepared for us some review and recommended changes to our bylaws. A couple of them were sort of cleaning up some things, and um, I don't believe that many of them were substantive. It looks like um, making terms gender neutral was the primary goal of all, all this stuff. Um, I don't know if anyone has any comments about the proposed bylaw changes that the staff has prepared for us to conform to various statutes and time frames for minutes and we're keeping minutes for the appropriate period of time. Lynn. I'll make a motion that we approve the as proposed by staff. 
and okay. I'd like to accept that, Mr. Chairman. I went through them, and I think there's nothing that we should be upset by. Okay. Um, before we vote, I want to share the staff's uh, recommendation from their memo that if this vote is unanimous tonight, then these bylaws are adopted. If it's anything short of unanimous, there is a follow-up discussion at our next meeting to consider it. Um, I don't have any proposed changes uh, to what the staff has offered. Um, I would suggest that perhaps for next year's, next round for the staff, um, I think that Alistair's position as secretary is more akin to being a vice chair than a secretary, and maybe that could be a name change. But other than that, I have no substantive concerns. I wouldn't suggest that for this year because it hasn't been part of a, a draft, but maybe that's something to put in the notes for next year. With that, all in favor of, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I have several notes here. Okay, what do you got? Number th Roman numeral three, article B. Yes. Not more than three alternate members who may serve. Uh, the charter only allows the council to appoint one alternate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are three alternate members currently in office. I'm sorry, it's the same, same confusing language. Which? I would throw that one. <laughs> okay. My goof. Okay. Pardon me. What else um, you got? If you go down to um, where is it? Page number. annual meeting, page four seven, and it still references town meeting. We haven't had town meeting in almost twenty years. In per se, legally four of seven on annual meetings. Oh yes, at the close of town meeting, it should say what An annual meeting. Yes, the, under the annual meeting, it says that we hold it following the close of town meeting and you're saying we don't do a town meeting we anymore. We don't do town meeting anymore. We so don't. no we don't. By law it's defined as annual meeting. It's the town's annual meeting? It is the town's annual meeting. Yes. But it's not town meeting in yeah. the context of what town meeting means or how it has operated in the um, past. Well all right. Um, Jillian, can we have the staff take a look at that one? And if it's necessary to put an edit there, let's take a look at it next year. Okay. I got another one for you. What you got? You have, you're going to have someone vote by proxy. I don't think that's legal. Where is that? Oh, that's, um, annual meeting in the paragraph C next to the last line. Members unable to be present for the election of officers may vote by proxy for officers of the board at this meeting. Right. That's not legal. I don't know the legality of it, but it seems like it's something we probably wouldn't want to do anyway. Um, well, if we could consider uh, adopting that amendment tonight if it's unanimous by this board to delete that entire sentence, members unable to be present, et cetera. The last sentence on page four of seven. Also moved. Second. Moved and second to delete that from the proposed uh, bylaws changes. Any other talk? No, but I would suggest that for next year you consider the fact, do you, let me ask you this, let me put it this way. You're allowed to attend electronically if there's a majority of, if there's a quorum present at the meeting site, which would take care of the issue that's in this paragraph about somebody not being able to attend and yet you have no provision. I don't know whether you, you don't, I don't think you need a provision because the law allows you to do that, but I don't know whether you want to consider putting something like that in. Okay. okay. Um, I don't know, but it's worth taking a look at. There are a couple of other places where our bylaws suggest that we'll follow certain statutes and obviously none of those are necessary since you're following the law anyway, but they're here. Um, Another one to put on the sort of the notes list on, what's that? There was a motion and a second to amend delete the, the bottom of page four of seven. seven. To what's that? Delete one to delete yeah, the sentence. To delete the sentence at the bottom of yeah. page four. Um, we haven't had a motion overall on acceptance okay. of the rest of the bylaws, have we? That was a motion just to change one but little bit. We haven't had the final motion. But we didn't vote on it. Yes, we did. If there's no other discussion on the amendment for the bottom of page four of seven, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Seven zero zero uh, for that amendment to the bylaws. Um, 
an additional comment for consideration for next year, just in terms of clarifying language. About the middle of page two, it describes that the town council representative of the planning board is absent. An alternate member will not be appointed to fill his or her place in accordance with RSA 673.11. And while that is absolutely correct, there is an alternate provision for the town council's representative in the form of a second town council representative. And perhaps that could be reflected here just to clarify that if the original, if the it's primary town council representative isn't available, there is an alternate appointed by the town council. Just to keep it. To say that. Yeah. So I don't necessarily want that to be something we work on right now, but we can figure that out for next time. Not that we don't have to have it, but it's available to us. Yeah. Um, with that, what's the will of the board with respect to the? We have a motion mm -hmm. and seconded for accepting these as now unanimous. Okay. Any other discussion? Uh, uh, did he make a motion? No, uh, he's I telling me we already had a motion. Lynn made, made a motion, motion. and I, and I seconded it. Uh, okay, we got you. I got you. Okay. And we and just made an change. We've adopted the change, and now we go back to the original motion, which was that <coughs> we accept these okay. as printed. Yes, right when I started talking about mm. unanimous, it, it needing to be unanimous, before that there was a motion and a second for okay. adopting the whole package, which, which I forgot <laughs> about. Now. Any other discussion on these bylaws? All in favor of adopting the staff's changes as amended tonight, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? 700 to adopt those bylaws, which makes that a final decision on those bylaws. That brings us to item four on our agenda, which is Fieldstone Land Consultants, PLLC, as the applicant, and Brett W. Vaughn Revocable Trust as the owner. And this is a pre-submission hearing for a conceptual subdivision plan for 12 residential lots located at 123 Wilson Hill Road in the R1 residential district. Tax map 4A, lot 23. Jillian, is there anything that we need to know before we hear from the applicant? I don't have anything further to add. Okay. Give you guys a minute to set up and sign in and then tell us what we've got before us today. Your green light isn't on, I don't think. Is it's it on. on? Bright? Pull it's bright, yes. Pull sir. Okay, pull a little closer to yourself then so it comes through a little bit better. Oh, there we go. Is that better? Yes, it is. Thanks. Okay, sure. Um, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. For the record, my name is Chad Brannan. I'm a civil engineer with Fieldstone Lane Consultants. Our office is located at 206 Elm Street in Milford, and I will be representing uh, Brett W. Vaughn Revocable uh, Trust this evening. <coughs> We are before you tonight, <coughs> excuse me, to uh, review a proposal to subdivide tax map parcel uh, 4A-23 into 12 uh, residential lots. The subject parcel is situated on the north side of Wilson Hill Road and has a physical address of 123 uh, Wilson Hill Road. The parcel consists of 59.1 acres of land and is currently occupied by an existing residence and outbuilding and associated site improvements. Zoning for the parcel is R1 residential, um, as it does have uh, severe soils per the NRCS uh, soils map, which requires a 50-foot front, 30-foot side, and 60-foot rear uh, setbacks. Uh, this zone also requires 250 feet of frontage, 300-foot lot depths, and 100,000 uh, square feet of contiguous upland areas. The topography of the subject property is generally mild with sections of uh, steeper slopes uh, mixed throughout, and the site generally slopes from north to south to Wilson Hill Road. The property does have some jurisdictional wetlands within its boundaries, which are depicted on the uh, conceptual plan that we have uh, provided. And the property is currently serviced with overhead electric, telephone, uh, cable, as well as an on-site well and septic. Uh, system. <clears throat> the plan that we have before you this evening depicts 12 lots 
uh, with 11 new lots. And if I could, Mr. Chairman, we, we actually did make some modifications to the concept plan. I'd like to uh, hand copies out to the board if that's possible at this time. Yes, please do, or you could just hand them to Jillian. We'll pass them down. I don't okay. want you to um, uh, be away from a microphone and, and say anything that needs to be on the record. Make sure Zina's got one for the record. I'll make sure. Thank you, Jim. There's a summary. It's actually a two sheet uh, yeah, kind of yeah, set, if you will, too. Okay. So, what's the difference between what you've handed us and the one that we've had to look at ahead of time? Um, essentially, we, we started to evaluate the uh, slopes of the site and, and modified some of the roadway geometry and associated uh, lot layout just to ensure that uh, we are in fact in compliance with the 250 feet of frontage and the 300 foot depth I believe um, one or two of the lots in the the old concept plan did not meet uh, those requirements this one has 200 feet of frontage the the ones off the cul-de-sac, there's three lots off the okay. cul-de-sac that do not. Gotcha. But the remainder of the lots do meet the regulations. So the new lots, uh, as depicted on that plan, uh, range from 2.3 to 5.69 acres in size. And the remainder lot, or the 12th lot, uh, would consist of the existing house um, and would comprise of 26.33 acres. All the new lots would meet the minimum lot size uh, and depth requirements. The frontage requirements will be met by all of the uh, new lots except for uh, the lots off of the cul-de-sac. Uh, we do plan on seeking a variance for the cul-de-sac lots and um, uh, for reduced frontage. The subdivision uh, will be serviced by uh, one cul-de-sac street. The intersection of the new road with Wilson Hill Road will provide an excess of 450 feet of sight distance uh, to the east and over 300 feet of sight distance to the west uh, with some uh, regrading near the intersection. So that would uh, comply with the uh, local um, ordinance. We do have some, I do have some photos that I'd be happy to, to show the board as well. Due to the geometry and topography of the site, the proposed road servicing the subdivision will be approximately 1,543 uh, linear feet in length. This will require a waiver from section 4.12C uh, of the <coughs> subdivision regulations, which states that the street shall be um, 1,200 feet in length. A typical 1,200 foot roadway would support 11 lots uh, based on the 250 foot frontage requirement as outlined in the R1 zone. <clears throat> I point this out only because I want the board uh, to see that we're not proposing a longer road to obtain an increased density. We are merely trying to present a viable um, subdivision plan. If you uh, take a look at the roadway alignment and associated stationing, you'll see that it takes nearly a thousand feet of road way uh, to secure four lots due to the geometry um, of the subject parcel. Well, Chad, when you say that uh, when you say that a 1200 or 1100 foot road would support 11 lots with the right, right frontage you're still going to be looking at those cul-de-sac lots that are going to be needing a variance right? Um, what I'm talking about is I'm speaking <coughs> merely to the geometry of the property if, if this parcel had standard geometry, we would be able to achieve 11 lots on a 1,200 foot road. Um, that's, that's all I'm speaking to. Oh, okay. It doesn't gotcha. pertain necessarily to the plan that you're looking at. Okay, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Thank you for clarifying. Um, so with this said, we are certainly interested in getting some feedback from the board this evening pertaining to um, the road length waiver that we would be seeking, the future waiver request. As I stated, um, we've started to evaluate the centerline grades of the proposed road, roadway and have found that the roadway standards 
uh, will create some significant cut um, on the front end of the development due to sections 4.12B and sections 4.12D. <coughs> Section 4.12B uh, basically outlines the maximum slope um, being 8%, I believe, for 600 feet or 6% for 800 feet. It's, it appears as though uh, within the paragraph under that section that the board has some levity as far as evaluating um, you know, every lot circumstance, whether it be geometry, existing slopes, and so on. So we would like to have some dialogue pertaining to that this evening if possible. To show the potential grades uh, based on these regulations, we have prepared preliminary profiles, uh, which I'd like to uh, review with the board, and that is the second sheet of that um, handout. And I'll just flip the board, my plan here this evening. The purple or magenta line on that profile plan uh, represents the existing grade along the roadway alignment. The green line is a proposed vertical alignment that we believe meets all of your regulations, and the red line is a proposed vertical alignment which does not meet um, your regulations entirely. You can see that the design that meets your regulations would require some significant cuts uh, for the first uh, roughly 400 feet of the roadway. If we could obtain a waiver from your regulations to allow a 2% grade instead of a negative 2% grade from the Wilson um, Hill Road intersection for a distance of 50 feet and a 9% grade from station 100 to 450, so for 350 feet, we could significantly reduce the cut and provide a design that better meets the um, existing terrain of the property. Chad, is this, is this roadway proposed to be a, a public road accepted by the town? Um, we are proposing it to be public at this time. Um, as you go forward with that, whether it's the road grade or the length of the road, um, my personal view of it would be impacted quite a bit on what we hear from DPW and the fire department. We so uh, make sure you get with them. I know the fire department's going to be wanting to see um, hydrants on a road that length. That's usually the key. The length of their of their hoses um, is the twelve is where the twelve fifty comes from. So you put hydrants, you have some more room usually. But go talk to Chief Courier and see what you get. Right, and we we certainly plan on working closely with the you know public works director and the fire department, but wanted to initiate the process um, before yep. the board and. No, glad to hear, but uh, m my vote would be strongly influenced by them. Okay. So, But have you got public water up there? Oh, we do not. So the word hydrant means you're going to have to put in some tanks to make Yeah, you'd have to have a cistern or you're something. You're going to have to have cistern use. tanks all the way up there. Typic or, or, and I, I'm thinking of another part of town where we have this same issue, which is the road to the dump. The fire chief ultimately didn't want the cisterns in, he wanted each house to be sprinklered. I right. warn you, I'm just telling you. Well, sprinklers create their own controversy, but in that particular subdivision, um, the board um, was prepared to pr approve the cisterns, and it was the applicant that came forward and suggested that they would All be right. willing to do All sprinklers right. instead. Um, the ability of a planning board to impose a requirement for sprinklers is um, pretty well hemmed in, and so let's not go there. All right, I apologize, <laughs> but I know it came up and it was a very contentious issue for several yep. meetings. Right. In yeah, no doubt. The sprinklers are fantastic, but your ability to require them as a planning board is pretty well hemmed in. And, and we certainly would, would expect to have a pretty detailed dialogue with the fire department on, I'm sure you will. on, on those topics that, that you I'm have sure raised. You will. At the same time, virtually anywhere up on Wilson Hill Road, if there's no public water and there's no hydrants, the hose link thing is going to come into play no matter what you do. There's just not really going to be a water source for any of the fire apparatus up here. Right. So that's typically where, you know, the cistern conversation would, would start. Ah, that's and why I raised it. <laughs> and having just gone through a fire out on Farmer Road where there were tankers and multiple lines, that's going to be fresh in their minds. 
Sure. Please proceed, Chad. Thanks. Sure. Um, currently, the site actually does have a 20-foot paved driveway which slopes up gradient from Wilson Hill Road at approximately 8 to 10 percent. So our desired design of 2 percent would be an improvement um, over what exists now. And we would provide uh, the obvious, uh, obviously there would be associated drainage improvements uh, which would co collect and convey all of the storm water um, from the road and associated lot development um, to meet not only the local regulations but this project would trigger um, state permitting regulations as well such as the alteration of terrain permit and so on. So everything would be uh, collected, um, treated and mitigated uh, prior to discharging into either existing ditch lines or, uh, you know, on-site uh, wetland areas. Okay. I think you can uh, see from <coughs> looking at the profile sheet that the alignment that uh, we would be proposing does uh, fit in much better with the existing terrain, uh, would require less land alteration and would provide for a better uh, finished product. Um, that would obviously be better represented in a grading plan and in design plans, which we, we don't have at this time. But when you're using words like better or less or something that compares it to something else, what two things are you comparing? This proposed road with what? If if you look at the existing the, ex the driveway, the okay. existing grade or the existing profile along that roadway alignment, you'll see that the the vertical alignment that we're seeking is much closer to that. Uh, which ultimately means there'll be less variation in, in terrain, less slopes, um, less drainage, um, and, okay. and land alter altering activities. I got you. Yeah, I, he I hear what you say, but you're comparing what is a private driveway, which is what it is now, to what is now going to become a public road, which the town is going to have to maintain, because I'm sure the town doesn't maintain going up that road, and I've been up it this evening. So, I mean, it's not really fair to say it's better than I mean, you're comparing horses and cows in my book. I mean, that is a private driveway. We have a set of rules for a public road that the town is going to adopt. So <coughs> I'm struggling. I, well, I, well, I agree with you. I think that um, the DPW and Kyle's team can bring us all the information back we need in terms of what they think of it. Right. And the, the existing grade alignment that you're looking at on that that profile isn't necessarily the alignment of the the driveway. So I'm not trying to make a comparison necessarily f from our proposed road to the existing driveway. It's really the proposed roadway alignment to the existing grade along it. Um, but j just for for clarification, I'm I just trying. You know, you're looking for comments, and you uh, you sure. got one. Sure, that's all. <laughs> Fair enough. Thanks. What else we got, Chad? Um, I mean, that, that basically um, summarizes, you know, the waivers that we're anticipating for um, this project. We certainly would ap appreciate and welcome any, any feedback that the board may have at this time. Um, I do have some representative photos of the intersection of, with Wilson Hill Road. If, if the uh, planning board would, would like me to uh, present those, I'd be happy to do so as well. Are you talking about on-site septics? These would be on-site septics, yes. All of the soil types that you've identified on here are severe, except for a little bit that's moderate, and not much of the property is in that moderate zone. Have you um, been able to do some test pits to figure out whether you can make septic systems work up here? Um, we've done very preliminary um, testing on site, and we do not see any issues with making the septic systems work. Uh, the severe classification is not necessarily a function of, of the soils. I think sometimes it has a lot to do with, um, you know, the, the uh, slopes as classified on the NRCS maps. But certainly uh, the types of soils that we've found in our, <coughs> in our uh, limited on-site testing at this point and, and in the background research has, has not indicated any problems with on-site septics. When you come back with a formal plan, I would suspect that as part of the peer review that CLD is going to do, they're going to look at those things, but obviously that information has got to be um, part of the formal presentation as to what those test pits and how they performed. Um, Desiree, you got your hand up. Well, just to the 
uh, to that comment with the test pits, there's been other plans before us where they've talked about uh, two potential locations if your, one of your septic fields goes bad, another pit where it could handle it. And you, so you'd show that on plan, those locations. Yeah, we've had subdivisions where you've got to indicate to us what you think the location of the septic fields would going to be. Right. That brings me to a question, though. On this plan that you distributed that was sent to us in the mail, this little rectangular symbol with a couple of triangles in it, what the heck is that symbol? That's just a, a representative house that's just kind of was, okay. was uh, situated on the lots. There's, there's no, <coughs> there's nothing f final about those locations. It's just merely part of the. Showing a place where a house could go. Right, okay. exactly. Um, Every single one of the lots uh, as part of the, all of this subdivision would require a state subdivision approval as well which means we'd have to do the test pitting um, that was, was just mentioned, and we'd also have to provide at least a 4,000 square foot space on every lot that would meet all of the state regulations for uh, septic placement. So, uh, and, and the size of that uh, square footage is conducive to uh, a primary and a replacement area. Um, they so make you cite a 4,000 foot EDA or just the ability to use the space because just the ability to use the space All right. um, what about water up here it would be on-site uh, wells have you done any testing to see what that's about because I understand from some of the folks in this area that some of the wells suffer, struggle a little bit you can come forward but you got to get to a microphone and introduce yourself Yeah, a little bit, right in the spotlight. I'm Brett Vaughn, 123 Wilson Hill Road. Thank you. And yeah, the, the Brett, well, can you like use the mic. The yeah, the well that I have right now is quite deep, yes. And I know that the neighbors on Wilson Hill Road have deep wells. Do you have any trouble with the production from the well? No, it's deep. When you say deep, what are you talking about? How, well, how deep? Mine's 1,400 feet. Yeah, that's deep. It's breaks everybody's record there but um, I think the rest of them are five or six anyway um, does any part of our site plan or subdivision regulation call for the applicant to demonstrate the availability of water and wells and things Nelson he has sort of to do that as knowledge. part of the state I don't think there's anything in our regs about it but it, he does for the uh, building approval I think he needs to produce a certain amount of water to make it and for an occupancy, you have to have a certain amount of water. No checking. And I yeah. don't know those numbers offhand, but uh, they have to do that, and they would probably want to do that if they were going to be selling yeah. houses. Well, I know, yeah. Uh, yeah, they certainly want to, yeah. but I, you know, a buyer yeah. buys the house and then finds out that the well ain't so hot. Um, yeah. Go get a mortgage. Yeah. Um, the bank will get them. <laughs> so uh, understanding the the situation with the availability of water I think would be a useful thing for us even if it's something that DES has taken a little bit closer look at um, just so you know that there are ways to do preliminary site assessments just using geological maps to be able to determine whether availability of water w is is viable enough to sustain a certain level of, of a subdivision okay and, and it can be like I said it's a fairly a simple desktop survey that a geologist or hydrogeologist can do and give someone a good idea okay Chad, are you familiar with that concept? Could that be a part of your submission to do that kind of a report? That's certainly something that we could look into, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, One of the dowser. What's that? We could just bring in a dowser. Yes, that could be all, all that there is to that. Um, Chad, when you were uh, speaking briefly about the site that's there, um, I, I thought I caught for a second something about overhead phone mm. lines or overhead power lines. You did. There, so, are, there is currently overhead yeah. utilities mm. servicing the the existing house. The requirement in a subdivision is going to have to be to bury them. I, un I understand that. That's pretty standard with these dead-end um, cul-de-sac roads. Uh, no, uh, it's, it's standard with any cul <laughs> subdivision. <laughs> yeah, su uh, cul-de-sac isn't the driver, but any of the subdivisions. But, um, you know, coming back and saying we've got, you know, a lot of ledge and a lot of tough terrain we don't want to dig up, probably not going to be well received by the board. So I was just curious. Sure is it? If it, it's the, the, the overhead at this point is about half the distance, maybe of the of the what the subdivision is going to be for the road 
Sure. So would it be any consideration that since that power then that power is there, then the rest of it is underground for the new for the new no. Okay. Yeah, probably not. I mean any of this any of the lots in the subdivision are gonna have to be served off of underground utilities as a part of the subdivision regulation, unless you can request a waiver and convince four of us to vote for it. Um, and you just said no. Doesn't yeah. sound promising. <laughs> doesn't, it doesn't well, sound promising. I've got a very unhappy track record of, didn't, of being unhappy with anything that isn't buried. Well, I'll you know, in, uh, up in that area, as wooded as it is, if you get any kind of weather or even ice storms and things, the overhead lines along Wilson Hill Road tend to get yanked off of all the houses when the trees fall on them. I think I remember coming to give you some gas for your generator, Mike. <laughs> Mike, this is up in your neighborhood, isn't it? Yeah, I think that I've been out here trying to get Mike some gasoline to run his generator because his power line got ripped off the house. So. And I think we've had Mr. Mr. Disco who was absent for a meeting while he was trying to get his generator to start. That's, that's yeah. true. I don't think that was because there's a tree pulling the line off of your house, though. No, it's not no, that close. Power it's somewhere up there. Um, I've been kind of hogging the conversation here a little bit. Is there any other um, comments or questions by members of the board for the applicant? Yeah. Mike? Um, I, I you know, agree with a lot of your comments so far, Bob. Um, I think a lot of the concerns regarding the severe slopes or the soil types with regards to septic, and then just road. And one of the things that um, Alistair and I have talked about recently is just whether that the, the, the types of soils will create poor conditions for road maintenance. And over time, the road itself will fail more readily than a normal road. And what could be done as far as provisions or engineering to try to help prevent what, that from happening. What kind of soils would in, would would bring about that kind of a situation? Those that are susceptible to frost heaving. And oh, so okay. they're the poorly drained soils mostly, they're tight, and so these have some of those properties. So it's something to talk with DPW about to determine whether or not they have any of those issues. We certainly see that on Wilson Hill with the with the intrusion of the of the high uh, bedrock and the yeah, effect of frost. get some heaves up there. Um, I know that a part of any subdivision, there's there's going to be a construction bond for the road and then a maintenance bond for two years after that. But I don't even know if two years gives you enough time to see what frost heaves are going to do for you. Right. And I know that the town isn't going to be inclined to want to repave that road faster than every other road in town because it's susceptible to that. So. Right. Yeah. The driveway that's there right now holds up better than the than Wilson Hill Road currently. Yeah. Good. I don't know if that's because I'm just lucky at the, <laughs> the ledge I have under there or what, but. Uh, it doesn't heave yeah. at all. Yeah, the, the soils from a construction <coughs> standpoint um, are actually, um, I mean, Chatfield, Hollis, Chatfield uh, complex soils are actually a pretty good um, soil uh, for road construction and for drainage. Um, you know, I can't speak to how the town's regulations classified soils as severely. I mean, sometimes the better draining soils are actually classified as severe because they perk faster and and uh, pollutants could could potentially infiltrate you know more rapidly into the into the ground but <clears throat> you know we'll certainly have a better handle on on uh, those concerns and, and and be able to address them when we go through and do much more test pitting of the property yeah. As a, you know, and as a part of a preliminary application, you wouldn't expect that. But in the in the final submission, um, you not only need to have that for the benefit of CLD, but for a certain engineer that used to sit on this board that will come out and talk about the dirt that you got. So. <laughs> quite quite aware of that. So. The only thing I would like to add is just you know I, I believe there's been some issues in the past with just the the intersection and runoff from the driveway and that sort of thing, and I don't know where that stands with whether those have been resolved or whatever. Um, so just, you know, I'm sure you're going to address all of that in your design, but certainly if we could go back to before the driveway was there to try to mitigate any sort of issues that might be currently occurring to that swale that goes down um, towards the west, if you follow me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, this seems just seems like there's, you know, if it's an outbreak, a spring outbreak and or something, but it seems like seasonally there's just, and when there's the right amount of storms, there seems to be a, a good rush of water that comes out of that, that area, so. Nelson, did you have some comments? Okay, well, yeah. Uh, Mike was touching on one of my main concerns is the drainage in the area, especially with the intersection with Wilson Hill Road. Going west on Wilson Hill Road, there's a lot of erosion, there's a lot of water, a lot more water than there used to be. 
and uh, we'd be looking I'd be looking for less runoff onto Wilson Hill Road than is there now because right now it damages the road it, it washes out and um, there's just it, it's just going on to neighboring properties so I'd be looking very carefully at that to see that that was all contained and somehow retained on site um, the uh, the site distance at that intersection also is a bit of a concern. Uh, as I recall, I'm, I haven't gone and tried your driveway coming out it, but it looks to me like there's a pretty big hump of, uh, of earth there close to the road right on the corner of that lot number one uh, and the driveway that would make it difficult to see to the west. And uh, it's, you know, cars kind of tool along there. It, they look, is that the uh, driveway coming into Wilson Hill Road? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, if you're looking to the west out of that car, yeah, that pile right there, depending where you're, if you're sitting in a sedan as opposed to an SUV, you're sitting lower, and you, you don't get a good view of what's coming. Chad, that area that you just <laughs> hit with the laser, is that in lot one? In your subdivision? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it is, and, and partially okay. within the town right away. Um, <coughs> we did do a field check for sight distance, and that corner would have to be, <coughs> excuse me, uh, would have to be regraded, but you, if, if that corner was just regraded slightly, you could um, exceed the 300-foot requirement uh, quite, quite easily. So that is an improvement that would have to be done as part of the, as part of the development. Yeah. Now, okay. Lot 1 and 11... I'm assuming you would intend to access off of your subdivision road and not off of Wilson Hill Road, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, fill me in a little bit on the status of what we decided the last time we were here with that access off of South Greater Road, and I guess it's lot 4A15, is that correct? What's going on with that? And it sort of the... the I have a different engineer for that one, so I'd, I'd have ah. to answer that. But uh, we there's really nothing. I, I've cleared... I cleared some of the, the timber and the brush, and um, I just haven't haven't yeah. gotten to it. But I, we, the, we need to improve, improve that road. Yeah. Sure. Well, recognizing that that 4A15 lot and the back mm -hmm. of 4A23 is sort of the reserved land, was there a reason why you excluded it from the subdivision and didn't try to sort of get a second access off of that bit of South Greater Road into the subdivision that you're proposing? A, I'm sorry. The uh, the lot off of South Greater Road could be a part of the could be joined to this subdivision and the, kind the, of the grade is the, you know the, the grade. Came, wetlands in the way. Someone came to you guys before I think with it's the awesome. preliminary to access from Greater Road and it's that's the steep part of the hill over there. I see. It just doesn't. It'd be really tough to come in where the cul-de-sac kind of just is on the flat top, top okay. flatter top. So that lot that's not colored green here, 4A23, that's going to stay separate. There's no intent to yep. combine those or have yep. those access. Yeah. Okay. Tom. Yeah, now that you bring that access up, um, about a month ago we got a request from someone on Wilson Hill to close Greater Road to undedicate it, I guess would be the word. I, I'm not saying I... Fortunately, I do not remember who it was, and they didn't provide us with any explanation or reason why they wanted it closed. Uh, I know the Conservation Commission uh, has been talking about doing gates and bars there in some fashion, uh, but um, and we we essentially kicked it to them uh, for their input and haven't heard anything back from the, the person who made the original request or from the Conservation Commission at this point, but. It's just something to, to. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. If there's an intent or at least a, a, a sense out there that someone may propose discontinuation of South Greater Road through there, or or subjecting it to gates and bars, if it's if it's gated and barred, it means it's a Class Six road, which means you can legally do that. But um, that's important to think about in terms of that access. No, but sorry. didn't the uh, council grant permission to use? South Greater Road as his driveway. Mm -hmm. I thought he got. Yes, a yes. Right. I think they're talking about past once the improvements done at the uh, at the end. At the end. Well, like my improvement goes okay. 250 feet and then cuts onto the 
you know, then goes to the driveway. Of the so new I'm certain they yeah. must be yeah. talking about at the end of that 250 oh. feet putting a gate. You yeah, it depends. That's, Although if someone wants to discontinue I, it completely, they just yeah. you could potentially have uh, a, 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 a way to buy that little bit of land from the town or from whoever owns it or do something else. But it, probably not worth the discussion here at this because it's got nothing to do with your <laughs> 11 lot subdivision. <laughs> No, just, so. uh, just, it yeah. just, you know, I, and, and I hesitated to bring it up because it's so ambiguous. But at this point, but uh, that request has been made. A Thank request you. has been made, but nothing further than just an email. Thank you for sharing that, Tom. Um, with respect to the the road length, um, it seems that the lots are um, relatively triangular and have some some property lines that meet the road at a fairly sharp angle. And that the length of the road, if it were longer, could allow for some more traditionally shaped lots. Of course, longer road, you're already looking at asking for a waiver of the road length. So I know that there's a give and a take there. Have you thought about how the lots might be laid out if the road was a bit longer so that you don't have the um, narrow pie shift pieces around the cul-de-sac? Well, there's topography. <coughs> I'm sorry. Topography looks like a problem. But go ahead. Could well be. I mean, one of the things that we're, we're trying to do is obviously reduce the length of the road and reduce the infrastructure costs, um, you know, the, of the project to the extent that, that we can. Um, <clears throat> we do need to satisfy the 250 feet of frontage, uh, so that that plays into a factor as far as the geometry. All of the lots um, meet and in, in most cases exceed the uh, minimum lot size requirement, so we could certainly look at uh, readjusting those lot lines if that you know that was a concern of the of the board, and, and maybe that can be accomplished with you know with little modification to the to the road length. I mean, we could <coughs> just for example, uh, Mr. Chairman, we could maybe take this section of the road and and maybe run it you know a little bit further to the north so that it's up in here, which would give us a little more room on the south side to. To square up sure. those lots, if that's if that's General, a concern. Yeah, I don't want to I don't want to um, get you down that road because, other than the flag lot at the beginning, the shape of lots really isn't something that we pass judgment on. Um, why does that lot one have that little flag hanging off of it instead of just meeting the road? I believe you're talking, and just for clarity, you're you're talking about this piece here. Yes. Yes. Um, I believe that's just for a lot area, but. Uh, let me let me do you mind if I just take a look at the plan I gave yeah, all my sure. reduced copies out sure. so uh, 2.3 acres is actually that hundred thousand square foot so we're, we're relatively close to that uh, minimum lot size requirement at 2.3 uh, acres so that's the reason for that how wide is that little flag that's the 50 foot setback is the dotted line so I'm sorry, not 50 feet. That's a. That's actually 30, I believe. 30 feet. So that's the 30 or 40 foot wide little strip that goes 100 feet or so. You may want to consider whether you'd ask the zoning board to give you a variance to allow that lot to have a regular shape if you chose to do so. I don't know if they would support it or not, but it, it makes more sense than drawing funky shapes on the map that the owners of the lo those lots will forget in terms of knowing where my land starts and yours stops and the next thing you know somebody's got a shed back there and how the hell did your shed get on my property and I, I, un I understand and um, <coughs> maybe, you know we may, we may very well do that um, just to try to clean that up since we're obviously going to be before them anyways so uh, for the those reduced frontage lots off the cul-de-sac I know that we've got a regulation that doesn't allow the flag lots when the flag is used as the access way, so you couldn't get to a road with a little narrow strip like that, but adding a little extra area to get a minimum lot size that way I don't think runs afoul of anything in our subdivision regulation. But um, you may just sort of make it a little bit of a cleaner design if there's a way around doing that. Mr. Chairman, I thought you were meaning if you push that road approximately a hundred foot further and I know I, I'm scaring it off a, a map which you shouldn't do but if you push that roundabout or rotary or whatever you like to call it in this day and age out to here which is a hundred foot extension on that road 
you would actually bring most of lots five, six, and seven into the 250 foot frontage by my count. That is what I was suggesting, yeah. although I don't know that it takes 100 feet or, or even more than that to get that far down there. And I think I heard a comment from Nelson that maybe the slopes make it difficult to put that road. But yes, that's exactly what I was suggesting is if Pushed the road was a little longer no. going straight through the cul-de-sac, um, you would get to where those lots didn't have to Tiny little access. angle so much. But then you have fire access. Fire it, hose length it, issues yeah. again. It yeah. would be, it, I mean, yeah. just to just to touch on that, uh, Mr. Chairman, it would be um, probably closer to at least a couple hundred feet that we would have to extend that to make all of those lots. Um, com I didn't comply. say you had to get to 250, but if you were to able to say, well, instead of having about 25 feet, which is what you got there, you could treble it. Say to say you only you got up to 100 foot of frontage. I think. The, plat the zoning board, and of course we don't have any say what they would say to you, but I mean that would make the, the lots a lot easier in terms of persuading the ZBA to give you the reduced frontage on those three lots if you were able to increase their frontage by pushing that round tree to there. Uh, I understand the point Lynn just made about the fire hoses, but the fire hose problem doesn't matter whether it's 1,200, 1,500 or what feet. The, 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 the fire well not really, they've got the problem now, period which is why they're either going to be Sisseton or Sprinkland. Yeah, w once you get over 1,250, the units of measure are 1,250 to the next cistern or the next hydrant or whatever, so. It means more tanks, more trucks, which means mutual No, aid. you're going to have, they're going to have to have a, a damn great tank somewhere, a cistern tank up here somewhere, whether you like it or not. Or oh, they're going for Sprinkland housing. The, the fire chief isn't going to let them, let a run, he's not going to agree to running hoses or, or tankers all the way up that road. At least I don't think he is. I'm speaking for the fire chief. I shouldn't do that. Especially in the wintertime. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Upslope in the wintertime. I saw some hand over here. I don't know. No comments? No. 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 Anybody over here? Um, a uh, pre-submission hearing isn't typically a public hearing, but I see members of the public here who probably have something to offer for us to consider. And so I would take advantage of hearing from them, if it's okay with everyone. Does any abutters or citizens wish to weigh in and offer the board something to think about in terms of this understanding that is a pre-submission hearing and this is not a final design by any stretch? No rush. Take your time. Please come forward and introduce yourself and sign in. When you're ready, tell us what's on your mind. Um, I have a couple concerns about uh, property. Mr. Wood, before you do that, can you point out on that plan which one is your house? Sure. You know, the house next to the driveway, I think. Yeah, I think it's this guy right here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, you're away from the microphone. For the benefit of those at home, it's 4A12, the second one from the green area. Okay, okay. please. Since I've lived at Wilson Hill Road, I've had nothing but water problems. I can go into it. I've got over $20,000 in my well that I have right now. It's deeper than Brett's. It's 1,460 feet deep. That well cost me $20,000 to dig. They came in and redrilled that well. I've gone through three well pumps. The people at Skillings and Sons know me quite well. If you call them up and ask them about that property, you'll see that I've gone through more wells and water pumps. And Summertime in, on Wilson Hill Road is very dry. Right now, I have water running out of every orifice on that hill. <laughs> Anywhere where the ledge stops, it runs into my house. I've got water in my basement. I've got two sump pumps in my basement right now. In July, I won't have a drop of water. <coughs> I go down to three quarters of a gallon a minute recharge rate. I think everybody on this board knows if you've been up there, that hill is all ledge, and the water follows the ledge down to the road. My yard has a swale in the back right now. It goes down 12 feet. I put it in when I moved there. 
I had enough water coming off that hill from when they scoured down that, dr drug all that dirt off that hill where my house was built, that that water will run down that hill like a, a river. It gurgles down my swale that's 12 foot down with rip rock down in it. It will almost wash down anything on the side of that hill down into the back area in front of my house. You're welcome to come out to my backyard right now and look at the hill behind my house has water running out of every place on it. Now, when you come out there in July or August, there won't be a drop of water on my property. My sump pumps will be completely dry. I will be washing, right now I would catch every drop of water off my roof so I can water my plants. I don't use any well water except for wash clothes, wash dishes, and eat. I'm telling you right now, 12 houses up there on Wilson Hill Road will drain everybody else as well because I do not know where I can get more water from. I've had dowsers come out and he's given me two alternative places too. In both those places, I would have to go into wetlands area in order to drill there. That's a big problem. Another problem I have is what do I do when all of a sudden now I don't have water and I spend $20,000 in one well and I've got two other ones that are dry on my property. I know, I understand everyone's right to do what they gotta do. He's trying to make money off the property he owns. My problem is if all of a sudden tomorrow I wake up again, like I've done many Sundays, called skillings on Sunday mornings because it always seems like that's the day they're out. They're, it's, it seems like they know it's Sunday morning and the guy says to me, oh, you need an emergency service? Yeah, I'm out of water again. So What do they do for you when they come out and you're out of water? They usually come out and check it and say, okay, you're out of water. They'll come out and fill the water tank up so I can at least get through at least that day. They can come and fill your water up, and they've done that before. What and kind I of can, water tank do you have? What, what size? Uh, my well? Water tank, did you oh, say? Oh, no, I, they fill my well up. They fill the casing up. Because when you're 1,460 okay, foot deep, and they put that water in there. That will last me a couple days at least until they can come out and figure out what they're going to do. We've hydrocracked twice on the same well after it was drilled 1460 to get the water we've got now. There is not a lot of water on Wilson Hill Road during the summertime. Anybody here who hasn't run out of water, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know. My next door neighbor on the other side has run out of water three times at least two years ago when they washed too many loads of clothes at one time. So there is a real limiting factor of water. And now my next question is, all this water coming out of the hill, their houses are going to be right behind mine. That's all ledge. Where does that water go to when they put out their septic tank? It follows the water line right down on top of that ledge, and it's going to come right out down onto my property. Most of my water comes out between 200 and 350 feet. How do I know that? Skillings and Sons, when they came out, they automatically tested how deep my well was, and then they started draining it to see how much water recharge was. So my water gets in there between 200 and 350 feet. So it's fairly shallow where most of the water comes from. But I get such a big residual storage, I can keep a lot of it. Now, when all of a sudden I've got these septic tanks that are sitting on the surface up above me, probably a couple hundred feet, they're going to come down onto that ledge. They're going to perk down as far as they're going to go. They're going to hit ledge, and they're going to come right down onto my property, probably about ground height or whatever it is, and it's going to come into my well. So what happens when my well gets contaminated by water coming out of septic tanks that are up above me? I don't have no recourse because now I'm stuck at the bottom of the hill. Like they always say, what always rolls downhill? And I'm at the bottom of that hill because these houses are right behind mine. And I'm all for him making money. And I understand he wants to develop the land. But I'm telling you, I see problems because the thing that we're lacking up there, there's no alternative source. I have no choice but well. I have no choice but septic. There is no sewer. There is no water lines up there. And power lines, like you were talking about, power is terrible up there. I've been without power enough times that generator, if you don't have a generator in Wilson Hill, you're just asking to be without power. So, I mean, it's a rural area. It's agricultural. I mean, farm roads still to this day, all the froth teams and everything else, we don't need more cars down there, but I understand they drive down there anyway from some other place. So. I just see a lot of problems with water and just having it or what do you do with it once you get it that you don't want. And that's my, that's my dilemma. Thank you for your testimony. Does any member of the board have questions for Mr. Wood? Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. I appreciate it. It echoes much of what I sort of already foresaw as being the concern up there. Please come forward.
Mr. Chairman, excuse me, I didn't catch that previous man's name. Could I have it again? Uh, Mr. Wood, what was your first name? Wood. Wood. Thank you. James Wood. Come to my property if you want to walk around anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Don't invite the world, huh? <laughs> only, only the record you. reflected his wife just scolded him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm James's neighbor, Fred Grimes. Hi, Fred. How are you? Very good. They put my third pump in this year in my well. Okay. Uh, static level of my well was 325 feet. I have a 600 foot well. I'm a little bit luckier than James's. Now, which house is yours? Uh, you said you're his neighbor, but I'm his neighbor at 117. So, to, to, the, to the right or to the, the left? Right. Going the right. down the street. Okay. Okay. So I think it's one thir It's 13. And uh, I mirror image everything he said. Everything he said. Okay. There was no lies in what he said. Everything is the whole I didn't think there was. wholesome truth. Uh, by the way, he also has. Are you still using the well on my property? No. That one's dead. No. He has a well on my property that there is an easement on. And, and I guess work. that thing never produced either, did yeah, it? Yeah, we just cut it off. Okay. I don't mean to interrupt the discussion, but everybody's got to be at a microphone to talk, otherwise the <laughs> folks at home can't hear. Okay. So. And like I, like I said, he had a there was a well servicing his property on my property also. That's which you didn't consistent mention. with everything that I've heard from the neighborhood. Is there's the also two dead wells that are buried on my property, from when I purchased my property way back when. It's just the water up there is totally. Non-existent, just about. I'm around three quarters a gallon per minute on a refresh rate, also okay. on my well. And uh, let's see what else I want to say. That's pretty much it. So, an ordinary uh, kitchen sink faucet or a bathroom sink faucet is more like three to five gallons a minute. So you're talking about something that barely runs water out of your faucet in your sink when you open it up. Uh, yeah, pretty much. You know, taking a shower, get wet, shut it off, pray you get rinsed off afterwards sometimes. You know what I'm saying? That type of deal. Okay. Thank you for that. Anything unique that uh, Mr. Wood didn't or that you would like to add in addition? Well, just that, you know, if they're going to blast up there, that worries me because here goes the ledge and, you know, <clears throat> what's going to happen to where the water goes. Okay. You know, we're going to be in serious trouble up there. Oh, Mike, I'm sorry. You have a comment. Mr. Grimes, if you could describe a little bit of the runoff that comes or run on to your property, uh, specifically like during some of the severe storms that we've had in the past. Uh, this year, the <clears throat> runoff was just about negligent hmm. that I had coming off. Uh, I'll have one section of my backyard that's, I think it's some of it comes off of uh, Mr. Woods' property. And my, uh, I'm going to say, west northwest corner. Of my property, you know, it gets it's very muddy there, and you know, you, you see water there like a little bit of a lake, and it's like muddy till probably next month. Okay. You know, very soft and everything else, but like I said, that we're very tight up there, very, very, very tight. And if the subdivision goes in in the back, yeah, I, you might as well just light fires to all these houses. Have you ever had to replace your septic? No, I have not. Yeah. Any other members of the board have questions? Thanks, Mike. Thank um, you, Mr. One, oh, one question. Yeah. Um, where does the where does town water come into? Obviously, it doesn't come into here. No. How close does it get? It's a McQuestion. McQuestion. Yeah. Yeah. McQuestion and Wilson Hill Road doesn't come up Wilson Hill Road, Road at all. It does, doesn't so go down two, mile, mile. two yeah. miles away. Exactly, because the nearest fire hydrant. Doesn't yeah. go down Wilson Hill. Yeah. What? Two, okay. doesn't it doesn't go down, down Wilson Hill at, at all. It does not. It does not. That's correct. Now, when they do the Chestnut Hill subdivision, is any part of that going to put? I know they're going to put sewer up there for Chestnut Hill, and that's going to be on public water. Yeah, but they're taking it off of the Bagusik Lake Road line. They're not bringing in. They're not bringing the water in through Wilson Hill or Bud Road. They're how, bringing. How close is the back of that Chestnut Hill property to the back of this? Not, not close. It's not close, yeah. And there's the intervening properties. There's no right of way. 
coast, yeah. And then on, it's uh, we could cross country lines are ridiculously expensive. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Grant. Thank you. Are there any other citizens or butters who wish to weigh in? This won't be your last chance. This is, again, a preliminary hearing. It's the expectation that all of the information you provide, all the information that we provide, is something that the applicant takes into account and has to um, come up with a solution that satisfies the town's consulting engineers and, and work that forward. So you should get notices of future meetings if it's a uh, project that the applicant proposes to continue with. The applicant may not, but if they don't, you should get notice. Chad, do you want to come back up? I know that you don't have answers to those kinds of questions today, but obviously uh, when you come forward with a formal proposal, identifying where these other wells are, identifying their wellhead 75-foot circumference around them that DES is going to make you observe for the septic systems and all that stuff is going to be part of what a presentation, would, what a submission would have to have incorporated in it and an understanding of um, the water situation especially. It sounds like what I've heard from some of the butters is that it's even more severe than I had imagined it was from the couple from here from Mike and from here from Nelson who live up that way. That's understood, Mr. Chairman, and we certainly, uh, <coughs> you know, have noted those concerns. Um, <coughs> as far as the the drainage stuff, obviously, that's something that we would we would have to address as part of um, our formal submission uh, for state permitting as well as local permitting. Um, Do you know if anybody's tested? Mr. Vaughn's well or any of the wells up that way for arsenic? I, I can't speak to that at this point, but that's certainly something that, that we can look into. I, it's, I mean, I know that it's an a issue in New Hampshire, and wells that have low productivity <coughs> tend to have the problem more than others. So. Nelson, you had a comment? Yeah, I was going to say those in bedrock do as well, and these are bedrock wells that they're talking about. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I, just to add a little bit while I've got the microphone, sure. I, I think uh, I would like to see some kind of a real hydrological study on this site. I think with this, some severe problems that have been brought to our attention and that we should have some professional look at it as far as the, the water availability on that site. Are you suggesting that's something the applicant should produce as part of their yes. project or something that they would pay the like a CLD consulting engineering to take a look at? I would expect they would pay someone who is professional and who is in that uh, business of understanding. No, I got that, but as a part of their submission or as a part of our peer review? No, as part of their submission. Okay, I got you. Yes. If they want us to consider this as a viable subdivision, I think they have to show that it has water availability. And I think we've heard enough today to say it's it may not be. It, yeah. It's something to worry about and the neighbors uh, impact as well. So. That's that'd be my take on it. Yep. Okay. I don't disagree. I think that that's a, a good thing to keep in mind that you would help to resolve a lot of the abutters concerns and the abutters concerns are at least for my part shared by me, other members of the board. So if you had that kind of a hydrogeologic study, you would um, help to resolve some concerns for the board and go a long way towards winning us over to believing that this is a viable subdivision. I think you have a question or comment? Yeah, I, I can make suggestions of folks that can help with that if, if the applicant needs. Need. Okay. So that's available offline if you need it. Um, are there other areas of this proposal that you want us to specifically comment on? I think we commented on the roadway, and it, I don't know if all of my colleagues agree with me that it kind of really turns on what we hear from DPW and the fire department in terms of the uh, road grade slope potential for waivers on that as well as the road length. And I can't speak for the fire chief any more than Alistair can, but I foresee that cisterns or some other source of water for a fire is um, going to be part of what the fire department is going to be looking for. And of course, water's already an issue. So <laughs> where do you get water for a cistern? So That's certainly s stuff that we will uh, further explore and uh, you know have meetings with with DPW and fire on. Okay. Are there other areas of this that you wanted some feedback on, some specifics? That's really all that we had for this evening's meeting, uh, Mr. Chairman. We wanted to introduce the project, and, and it, it's, it's been very helpful to uh, you know receive your feedback this evening. Appreciate your time. I think that if you guys can iron out some of those engineering difficulties with the water and potentially with septic systems, um, 
you've got nice big lots in an area of town where you'd probably have a great view out the window and probably a lot of people would love to live up there. Quiet, out of the way, see some nature, but it's got to, it's got to work with the neighbors and it's got to have all, all of the <laughs> essentials for life there, water, sewer, all that. you got to be able to take a shower. Sure. got to be able to take a shower. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, no, no, no sprinkler in the lawn and all that. Um, thank you so much, Ted. If you don't need anything else from us, that's all we thank have you. for you. Thank you. Appreciate your time. That brings us to item five on our agenda. Uh, item five on our agenda, which is discussion and possible action regarding other items of concern. Um, one of the items of concern that we should discuss is the um, immediate future of our bike and pedestrian um, subcommittee. Um, I can certainly give you a little bit more background on that. Um, as we had discussed in various meetings, there was an effort by that subcommittee to get some assistance from the National Regional Planning Commission. Um, getting that assistance required some approval from town council. Pardon me, folks, do you mind if we, out in the hall. Sorry, I didn't mean to be rude. Um, <laughs> getting some assistance from the National Regional Planning Commission required some approval of town council. Um, and after a, a, a good long debate, the majority of town councilors didn't support um, getting that assistance because they didn't uh, favor having sidewalks developed. Um, and that put the, um, the work of the subcommittee sort of in limbo, whether it's um, whether you could produce a sidewalk and pedestrian plan, and if you did, whether there's a reason to. Um, with that kind of a effort from uh, response from the town council. Now I, I think the vote was three to four in the, before the town council, so it's probably we'll work on Tom while he's here and try and swing some votes our way or something like that. But um, for now, it seems like gathering some more information or sort of putting the group kind of in a pause is a better approach than to continuing to meet every week and um, essentially run towards a brick wall. Um, but before we even open that conversation, the one thing that I do want to do is mention that Desiree has done a fabulous job at being the chair of that group. Mm -hmm. Has yeah. gotten quite practiced at running a meeting, and um, you know, maybe someday she'll get to sit in the middle of the room here. <laughs> thank you, thank you for your work with that. Um, but could I, I just don't know add if Desiree and Alistair and oh. Nelson want to add to the general sense of what the status of the group is or what its future should be. The only thing I would add, Mr. Chairman, is if you read the union leader today, the city of Nashua has just been given $125,000 to develop a sidewalk improvement plan for the town, which when you know, re remember that Nashua already forces pretty well anybody who wants to do anything in, that, in the town to put in sidewalks, the fact that the city has been able to get another $125,000 to further support the work it's quite an interesting comment, but I don't want to be rude to anybody or say anything more. No, I don't, I mean, Tom, I don't know if you take it as being rude, but I think that everybody ought to have their own opinion, whether they disagree or not doesn't make well, it rude. Well, I, I, I do have my opinion, and I stated it the other night. Yeah, sure. Okay, and, 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 and it's not that, I don't think that the council is adamantly opposed to any sidewalks, okay? We just like to feel that what you're going to be proposing is going to be something that's going to be relatively manageable. And like I said, it's the, you know, it's the, it's the incremental cost over time that you're building up. And if you read the Sunday edition of either the Telegraph, the Telegraph, okay, about their budget issues with the state and the, and the downshifting yep. that they're anticipating from the, from the state budget, okay, you know, this is, this is at least where I'm coming from. Okay, in terms of in terms yeah, I'm not of challenging issues. your opinion. I was just yeah. suggesting that it isn't necessarily, uh, I, I wouldn't, and I don't know if you do, regard it as being rude if someone has a no, different opinion. No, I don't. You know, look at it this way. What does Thomas Jefferson say? The difference over religion and politics is not a bar to friendship. Okay? So it's, 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 an, honest, it's an honest difference of opinion. Oh, I agree. And, and so, you know, if, if and, and I, I've known Alistair long enough. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that sounds like the kiss of death. <laughs> if he doesn't, you know, it, it's 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 you know, if, it, hey, you know, I, I'm in the position, 
uh, you know, I'm in the position on the council, and not everybody agrees with my posi my personal position on something, and not everybody agrees with what the council may decide to do as a majority, uh, mm -hmm. and that's that's it. I mean, that's that that's life. That's the way it goes sometimes, and I, it's not know, and it's not and and I I'm not trying to tell you not to pursue it. It's just that when you know we're we're just I'm concerned about the scale. Okay, you and I had a discussion before um, that I thought that there's a lot of places in town, there's some places in town where it makes a lot of sense, and there's other places where I don't, I don't necessarily agree with it, I, just because I think of that the, there's, the frontages. I think there's some commonality between your view and what the committee was after that maybe you didn't perceive, but um, for the committee standpoint, our regulations now require sidewalks everywhere. Every subdivision requires sidewalks. Every commercial site plan requires sidewalks. We think that's a bad idea. I think you think that's a bad idea. Yes. The idea, the intent of the group was Step. to fix that, but we're not going to get there. I know, and and, and 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 part of this is that perhaps we should have we should have taken advantage of the opportunity to sit on that committee, and this may not have happened. Perhaps so, and I don't want to um, t take our time tonight to sort of re-debate all the pluses and minuses yeah. of sidewalks. I really just wanted to kind of update the group that we're at a place where perhaps um, uh, as individuals gathering some more information about sidewalks, what they cost, what they cost to maintain, where they can be, where they make more sense, and getting some public opinion makes more sense than coming together each month, once a month, to drive towards a plan that um, really does need some professional help to develop and we're not going to get there that way. So it was a vote of the sidewalk committee to put it in park for a season and see if we don't get some more information and share and learn and move forward together rather than kind of heading in opposite directions with some folks concerned about one direction or another. Um, but since the committee was formed by this board, it takes a request voted this board to put it in park. So <laughs> what's the discussion? Is there any more discussion? Is there the, what's the will of the board if there's a motion? I will just discuss, if I may. Oh, please. Uh, one more time, I will say that I thought there were some things that the committee could do if uh, even though we are, are precluded from doing any study overall, uh, we might do some work in developing uh, public interest in sidewalks and assessing, doing a better job of assessing the public desire to at least fill in some of these gaps that we've got that we hear about all the time, how we've got gaps in the sidewalk and, and uh, you know, and, and to identify those things and improve on them is, is I think, a worthy thing to do. Um, so I wanted to uh, I had suggested to the committee at the time we made our vote that, that we do that, but the committee members felt that they shouldn't uh, spend any more time at it because we were kind of wasting our time if we're not going to get any support from the council. Well, it's a very worthy comment. Um, Desiree, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I, I agree with what you're saying, Nelson. I think the forum, given that doing it on the public clock at the moment, it doesn't make sense to do without staff support on it. Uh, I believe that those conversations should happen when we have lulls in our planning board thing. Like if you find some information, share it after minutes, do little presentations, bring in experts here Add from it time into the to discussion time. And yeah, possible. yeah, yeah and concerned. we'll just go from there and we'll take it individually as, as opposed to a total coordinated effort and then in a year or so we can sure. look at it on the board to reevaluate where we stand. Thank you, Desiree. I want to add a little bit to Nelson's comment because although I like the idea of getting public support, I think that getting the town council support turns on getting some public support. I have to say that I found when we when I posted a couple of things on the website for the Merrimack Forum, there was a lot of comments and a lot going on. But as we met here month after month after month after month, more often than not, it was the handful of us. A couple of times, you know, Fran from the zoning board came over. A couple of times there was one other person in the room. Um, as much as we met and talked about it, and we're on TV, people do watch this. There wasn't like very many people at all that wanted to actually come out and engage the process. So 
they may have a, 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 an opinion one way or another as to what should happen, and I walk here, and wouldn't it be great if I could get to this place without a sidewalk? But um, if there's not enough energy for people to want to come out and sit in the room and do something about it, that maybe says a lot in terms of whether it's ripe, whether the effort is ripe. Um, I do think I support the sidewalks, and I think that their time will come, but I think that it takes more than a couple of nutty planning board members <laughs> to drive that train. I think you got to have the public behind it. Any other comments or questions? Mike. Um, is there an opportunity, kind of bridging off of what Nelson said, to expand it in just the concept of the, the non-motorized transportation? Uh, and, and maybe you guys have talked about that, like the trail system, as well as um, some other efforts you've done with the downtown uh, master planning concept. Well, the town center committee still works and meets, but we have a restricted area in right. which to work. And um, we are doing some things with trails right now. Hopefully we're going to get a grant here, uh, which the council is going to vote on in a couple of weeks, whether they accept it or not. And uh, if they accept it, then we'll have a grant to work the trail. But it's the Sohegan River Trail. It's not a sidewalk. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, our uh, proposal from NRPC would have uh, looked at bicycle as well as let's say non-motorized non-motorized transportation. Yeah. It was included in their in their review of what we had in place. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the town center committee isn't really doing much with bicycles. They're looking at just the town center right. and implementation of a plan that was done by NRPC earlier under the auspices of the town council. The town council's charge to this town center committee is to implement that proposal which the, which the uh, uh, NRPC put together for us. And it really identifies where sidewalks are and where they aren't and where they should be. And uh, those are three different <laughs> categories. Yeah. But uh, uh, so it's, it's kind of a separate thing. It's restricted to the town center and it's just in that area. The one, what we were asking NRPC to do uh, as a subcommittee of the planning board was to look at Route 3 end to end. And that was uh, give us just Route 3 end to end. Our ultimate goal, of course, would be to do it for the town. But at least we'd get Route 3 and get uh, get some of those gaps identified yeah. and uh, insulated for Now, to, to add, I think, onto what Mike's question brought up is um, as we've worked at sidewalks and pedestrian and bicycle um, work around town, there is um, two camps that look at the, the two of the camps that support sidewalks or walkways look at them differently. One is looking for Greater Woods, Horse Hill, Sauhegan Trail type nature walks and exercise walks and another camp wants to get from a place to a place. And um, that sort of splits the sidewalk supporters into two groups that in some way kind of lessens the influence yep. that they have um, because they <laughs> don't, neither one of them sees the other, <laughs> the other person's camp as having any value. So it's a little bit of an unusual quirk to it. Um, but some folks want to go for a three mile run through Greater Woods or a snowshoe or a dog walk or whatever. Um, and others want to be able to get to a grocery store or a school without getting in the car. So. But um, I interesting developments, and you know, I think that that stuff will continue. The town's master plan, the one we just adopted, incorporates the ambition to have some sidewalks. If there is a sidewalk master plan, um, those plans have quite a lifespan, and uh, when uh, times change and different folks have different political wills and um, there's always a chance to move something forward at one point in time that didn't move before and um, you know, it's n not an unusual part of the process for there to be um, steps ahead and then steps back and pauses and things. So. Other thoughts or comments? We would need a motion if we're going to um, pause um, the work of this group. I'll make a motion that we uh, temporary suspend the sidewalk committee until such time that we see fit to review the committee again. Okay. Is there a second for that motion? Second by Mike. 
Mr. Chairman, could I add a, one rider to that, that we make a determined effort on a maybe quarterly basis to just at least at this meeting spend <coughs> five minutes, ten minutes talking about it, see if there's been any change. I don't say we should spend a lot of time, but has there been any change, yay or nay? I think that that's a fair suggestion, mm -hmm. whether it's part of the motion or not. Well, it's up to the, um, whether the, whether the, Ms. Desiree would accept it. Hmm? doesn't need to be part of the motion. You're, you're coming to the meetings, uh, like the rest of us, you want to put something on the discussion items? Go ahead. Um, let the motion stand as it is. One all of right. the things that I would offer up for all of the planning board members who necessarily, who weren't necessarily a part of the regular meeting of the, um, of the sidewalk committee, um, one of the more recent documents that were produced by that was a legal opinion about construction of sidewalks, maintenance of sidewalks, and a bunch of other things that um, uh, lent a lot of clarity to a lot of issues that are discussed and perhaps misunderstood. Um, since it's a legal opinion offered to the planning board, it's available to all of you. It wouldn't necessarily be made public unless we vote to make it public, and generally you don't make legal opinions public that way. But um, I recommend it. I think everybody ought to go take a read. Um, if you've got access to it. It was very enlightening and um, provided some answers to a lot of questions that I've heard in discussions people suggest the exact opposite of what that legal memo provided. Mm. So with that, if there's no other discussion. Where do we find it? Um, could that be circulated to the, the board could members? Could you circulate it? Yeah, you wanna, Jillian, you want to handle an email to send that out to everybody? And you're distributing it to the planning board? To the planning board. Yeah. And would you consider distributing it to the town council as well? Not yet. Or you know, you I'm not sure if it wasn't already distributed to the town council. Yeah. Well, about a year ago? No. Sooner than that. This is brand new. Well, I understand that. But I made the same query to, to town council. Can you clarify for me the relationship between how sidewalks and roads and those those sorts of things and the planning board and the town and the town council or the governing body interact in these particular issues. And that's not exactly what I said, okay? <laughs> but that's what I was looking for, yeah. okay? So this memo does cover that from the attorneys. It also covers the obligations to maintain sidewalks, which was a, sort of a key question. It covers a little bit about the Americans with Disabilities Act and how it might interact with sidewalks. Yeah, there's a, um, uh, I will send you all a copy of a um, town and city article that was published a few years ago about sidewalks that gives all the legal background and sites and whatnot. And you can take a look at that. I think we have distributed that one because I remember seeing that one with the winter maintenance of the sidewalks. Yeah. Do it again. So. Do it again. Do it yeah, it doesn't hurt to do it again. Let's do yeah. it. I stumbled, I stumbled across it today when I was going through my, cleaning now, out my inbox. Now I have to say, without revealing too much, that the legal opinion that we have doesn't always agree with that um, uh, municipal association article from town and country, or town and city, whatever that thing is called. Town and city. What a surprise. <laughs> said that before you get two lawyers in a room you get three opinions <laughs> but we don't we don't have a membership with the municipal association anymore so that's right <laughs> so maybe we've decided we disagree with them on purpose okay um without belaboring this any further or making you know um veiled references to what a legal opinion says that we're not going to make public um what's the will of the board we ready to vote yes yeah. all in favor say aye aye, aye. any opposed <laughs> One opposed. Nelson's opposed. Any abstaining? I abstain. Town Councilor uh, Mahan is abstained. So that is a 5 1 1 vote. Zaina, you got all the names right? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, also, on other items of concern, uh, Nelson has provided for us some information that he gathered from the New Hampshire Office of Economic Planning Planning and Zoning Admit, uh, Conference, which was this past weekend. And that is this collection of co photocopies that are a little gray in color on the front. Nelson, you want to tell us a little bit about this? I'll just tell you a little bit and uh, leave the rest. Uh, I won't try and read you the whole document, but I will say that it was a very interesting conference, as they always are. There were many things on the agenda, but it's divided into segments, so you can only attend three of the possible uh, sessions. Okay. And uh, one of them was what's called a double session. The one I signed up for was the uh, the legal opinions and 
recent legal changes, which is always interesting to see how the courts are coming down and, uh, and what the legislature is doing to our planning process. I should mention also that Jeff was there as well, and he attended some different sessions than I, so he could probably talk to those sessions that he attended afterwards. But uh, there was, there's the agenda itself, and then attached to that are the uh, view graphs that were presented at the, um, the uh, land use law review, the, the statutes and the uh, statute changes and, and court cases that have come up in the past year. And uh, some of these cases that he mentioned are still pending. The, and as are some of the, uh, of the uh, legislation that's discussed in here, some of it has not gone through both houses, but it's up there being considered. The front two pages are the most interesting. There, there's a whole bunch of websites that you can, uh, you can access from home and find out all kinds of uh, things that's what's going on around the country as well as in New Hampshire uh, as far as that goes. And then there's a legislative tracking website where you can watch where the, what's happening to these bills and where they're being uh, um, uh, committee studied and that sort of thing. Um, the, uh, the, they talked about, well, the uh, big changes, that they're talking about vesting. The vesting is still an issue. Um, they have a thing on road standards where there's a potential bill that would take road standards out of the planning board's jurisdiction and place it strictly under public works if that were to be adopted by the community. Let's the community make that choice if this, if this legislation passes. Um, there's notifications on uh, zoning changes. Um, there's a, uh, uh, some bills pertaining to clean energy districts where the uh, town communities can give special tax breaks to people doing to certain certain zones in the town where they uh, are can do uh, solar if they do solar um, electricity generating and that sort of thing and um, those would have to be enacted by the council again they're not under strictly under planning board um, there's a talk about uh, private covenants. There's a bill to allow towns to enforce private covenants between landowners, which the OEP, OE, <laughs> the OEP thinks is a bad idea. For so do I. Probably for good mm -hmm. reason. Well, it says, why, why would you want to get in the middle of that? <laughs> but, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> somebody's got a, an idea. The, the, our legislature, you know, is made up of citizen uh, legislators with various ideas that are gleaned from their personal experience, and they put these things forth. Um, there's a uh, uh, process, uh, a, a bill to change, uh, uh, to allow applicants to request a different consultant. If planning board hires a consultant, as we do with uh, our uh, engineering consultants um, the uh, in the applicant challenges that he can request a different consultant to review it which is kind of interesting <laughs> yeah I, I think there's the actually a bill being presented that requires the towns to provide applicants with options for which consultant to use well yeah, it, it just says they may request a different co uh, uh, consult uh, consultant, and they may suggest, this is the applicant. That, that may be a different one, may but the other one is there as well. Yeah, this is SB 98, and it's the pending yep. legislation right now. Then there is, um, let me see here, to reverse administrative appeals, this phase development rules. Um, and there are uh, some rules on accessory dwellings. Uh, they uh, 
one of the changes, I think most of it is things we allow. A lot of towns don't allow accessory dwelling units, and I think there's a push in the legislature to allow more of that. Um, the uh, This particular bill, this uh, RSA 674, 67, 68, which is a new section, um, it says you cannot limit them to family members. I think we do limit them to family yeah, members we now. Pardon? Yeah, we do limit it to family members, yeah. and um, we also have a proportionality between the square footage of the ADU and the yeah. main building. Yeah. Then I don't know that if that would fit into Ooh. this. Um, this particular bill, actually, Representative Chris Christensen asked me about it and asked him about it, and our yeah. view was that we already sort of have a fair approach to, rep yeah. to regulating accessory dwelling units. And so this wouldn't necessarily mean much to us as a statute. Right. However, um, both Tim and I immediately sort of felt um, the local control that allows municipalities to decide their own fate has a value to it that makes you want to say for other towns, let them decide for themselves, don't have the legislature dictate yeah. it to them. Yeah. Um, and so I think we suggested that we didn't favor this bill not because of the accessory dwelling unit provisions, yeah. but because of local control. Yeah, that, that makes complete sense, Bob. But it seems that there are a number of towns that don't allow them at all, period. And you that's know. what the motivation of this bill that's, was, is sort, sort yeah. of like some of the workforce housing and yep. manufactured housing exactly. statutes that are out there was to yeah. punch a hole through some of the barriers that are out there in some towns that just don't want them. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why you wouldn't want one, but you know. Everybody looks at things differently. That's why they have their own planning board. <laughs> right. right. Uh, the last one there it completely eviscerates the OEP, gives away all their authority and responsibilities to other groups, and <laughs> leaves them with nothing. That oh, They expect that will not pass. Then there's well, this before you leave that one, though, although I expect it won't pass either, yeah. the designation as House Bill 2 means that somebody's tied that to the state budget. Right. Oh, okay. I didn't which means that somebody's bargaining yep. with that chip. Yeah. Yep. Oh, okay. <laughs> Watch yep. out for that. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Um, then there's the uh, recent Supreme Court decisions um, going on from there. Uh, this uh, Baker's Realty. Well, uh, they talk about these things called 3JX orders, and those aren't. Those are interesting little things. They're not really Supreme Court decisions, but if you're going before the Supreme Court and you ask for a three-judge review, you can have one, and they will review it and give you a, a decision just like the full Supreme Court would. However, none of the, uh, it, they don't set any precedents. They can't be used in an argument for setting precedent, which is, an odd twist. Yeah, they are a little bit unusual. Um, in yeah. practice, the Supreme Court decides when you're going to get a free JX, whether you want one or not. <laughs> oh, okay. and, um, yeah. and I, I don't know if they do it in cases where they want to make a decision that doesn't set precedent or yeah. whatever. They usually have to be unanimous. If they're not unanimous, you get kicked up to a five-judge review. Yeah. Um, although they're not precedent-setting, they certainly are insightful in showing what three judges, who are of a majority of the court, because yeah. five is the full panel, yeah. if three of them think one thing, it's pretty important to pay attention to that. So yeah. although you wouldn't say this case says that this has to happen, yeah. I think that anybody that would look at it would say, boy, those are some pretty strong tea leaves. Yeah. So. Yeah. But. Okay. Um, the. Uh, this Baker's Realty versus Winchester, so on. The important takeaway from this was the importance of the planning board's minutes. Uh, the, uh, the case, uh, they cited some reasons for denial of the application, and then they, uh, the uh, uh, the applicant said that the, the, the uh, there wasn't enough detail in the decision that the board made when they put out the denial. But in defending the board, they presented the minutes of the board, and the minutes of the board had enough detail in it to 
convince the judges that this was a valid uh, decision. So it just emphasizes the importance of minutes and keeping good minutes. And thank you, Zina, for taking such good ones that we have. And I think a lot of towns don't have them as good as this as we do. So um, the uh, let's see what others that are important here. The developer demonstrate a floodplain. Um, and uh, uh, let's start with Demi This Dembiak versus the town of Holden, this goes on and on and on. This is one of these cases where uh, uh, an applicant came and uh, he owned a piece of property with a boathouse on it, on a lake. And he came and asked for a building permit to build uh, another house, a house to live in and he was granted the permit. So he got the house about three quarters built and went looking for an occupancy and they said, we can't have an occupancy, you gotta, you gotta tear down the boathouse. <laughs> and so this is still going on, it's gone on for a couple of years, but where the town has you know, endangered itself by granting, issuing a permit. What? No. <laughs> It's been known to happen more than once. Let me just leave it there. I've had a couple of those clients over the years. I have yeah. to add some folks that built a million dollar home on Winnipesaukee mm -hmm. and were like ready for their certificate of occupancy. I mean, literally there was nothing left to do. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the uh, code enforcement officer, uh, the building official changed in town and the new building official says, I don't know why you got your first permit. This should never have been allowed to go forward. Yeah. I'm not going to. And then, you know, we went to the zoning board, and the town sort of found yeah, some yeah. compromise that worked for everybody, yeah. which apparently Holderness hasn't done in their case. But um, it was a fairly tension-filled effort with the zoning board where we were presenting a variance argument or perhaps a different interpretation of the ordinance that would allow some relief while the zoning board was afraid that the next step, if they didn't do that, was that you're going to claim estoppel and that, that you've, the town has led you to spend a million dollars building yes. something yeah. and hang it out there. Now, I think that the town made the right decision to grant the variance and because it was worthy of a variance and it met the criteria and all of that. But if they hadn't, where else is the applicant going to go? Are they going to tear down their million dollar home? No. no going to go to court. Supreme court. <laughs> right. Fight like hell. And, um, from a town's perspective, those kinds of legal fights, win, lose, or draw, will put a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollar hit in the budget. Yeah. So. Yeah. The so lawyers always get paid. Yes, they do. Yes. They we do. had something like that. Yes, those, we did. Those, those condos behind Citizens Bank. Um, okay, behind Citizens Country Bank. Crossing. Yeah. Oh, Country Crossing. Yeah. 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 They issued, yeah, Dana Patterson built it. They issued him a permit for buildings, buildings that were m below the minimum square footage. You had to put yeah. those porches yeah, on the back of them oh. in order to meet yeah. the square footage requirement. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I do remember something about that case. I do remember when it happened. It was a bit of a fuss. Yeah, I think that the the take home lesson that I have, I don't know, I'm not familiar with this whole this case. The take home lesson that I had from my other cases, and it sounds like from this one is. Um, towns ought to be pretty careful about who they're putting in charge of the, the code Absolutely. enforcement and the building officials. It Absolutely. matters. It does. Hiring it does. some guy that just is a builder from somewhere and thinks he knows what's what. Yeah. Ah, it's just, it lucky. makes sense we're to hire lucky. professionals. We're lucky in this I agree with that. We're lucky right now. Yeah, we've been unlucky. We've been, we say we're lucky now, we weren't. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. you may. Thanks. <laughs> okay. You agree? <laughs> I told you. We are, we are lucky right now. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's what totally. I'm okay, there's uh, a few cases on impact fees and who gets paid the impact fee when the impact fee has to be returned and who is the rightful heir to the impact fee six years later when the original builder has gone out west to build something different and. Uh, and so on, and the courts have pretty much decided that it should go to the present owner. If there's a transfer of property, the 
the impact fee that was being returned is, is returned to that property. And But this guy was uh, fighting that, and um, KLN Construction Company. But uh, they... Uh, I've had that come up, too. You have? Yeah. yeah. I had a condominium association come to me and say, our developer put down a bunch of impact fees in our town. Mm -hmm. Six years have gone by, hadn't been used. Mm -hmm. We want our money back. Yeah. And fortunately for that, in that case, the town didn't have any trouble deciding who to give it back to. And yeah. Everybody agreed. The develop Just you like you say, the developer was gone. You're the not developer around. was gone. See, in this case, the developer wanted the money. So he came yeah. back at them and wanted, felt he was entitled to the money. See, very often what you end up with in a, in a town that wants to keep the money is they're looking for some excuse to give it to somebody who isn't here. The yeah. Whoever's gone, the yeah. guy that bought it originally and sold it, then, yeah. or the guy who paid it and isn't here, the developer, whoever's gone, that's who the so town says, oh, well, we'll you know, it's Nelson's it. money, so we got to keep it. We can't find him. So Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's usually the way that that's, these, that's these things break out. That's what triggered this as well, yeah. So they say to be very, very careful when you're doing impact fees. When you structure your impact fee, you've got to have a good attorney on your on your staff. <laughs> yeah. I'm mean, writing your ordinance for you. Avoiding the problem isn't particularly difficult. At the time you collect it, you can identify where is it going to go in six years. and You, know, you could do that it out. that way or else put it into the statute that has the impact fee that says clearly you know, yeah. who will get it when it's well, it seems it like the back. court's saying that it goes to the current owner, so you don't really get much discretion anymore. But no, by now you should you should have it down. But they still advise you to get a good lawyer to write your impact fee. <laughs> and <laughs> and that makes sense because although it seems to be everybody's approach that the current owner ought to get the money, um, there's plenty of room for a legal challenge to that because the current owner didn't pay any money. Why are they entitled to get money back that they didn't pay? But they they now own the property and it was given in the name of the property and when the property was sold, that was sold with it. I mean, that's the other side of that argument. And ostensibly, yeah. they, the price they paid included, included the cost that. of that. Yeah, the cost thing. of that. Yeah. Well, you know, in a, in a site plan, it definitely works that way, but if a subdivision comes, like a 12 lot or 20 lot or something like that, and they've got to um, pay a million dollars, the developer has paid a million dollars, do you divide it by square footage? Do you say each lot has a per equal share? Is it proportional to what they paid versus, you know, there's a lot of ways to sort of say, you know, this really wasn't intended to be attached to yeah. Nelson's lot versus Mike's lot versus Bob's lot yeah. or, or how that does. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. I don't want to get sidetracked on the debate. It's a, it, is a, it is a messy issue that's worth figuring out before six years pass and somebody comes with their hand out. For their money. The takeaway at the end says impact fees are complex to assess and administer, even with professional staff. Look before you leap. That's the advice. So, <laughs> now yeah. for our own benefit here, we don't have any standard impact fees, although we do occasionally have off site assessments for yes. traffic lights and things yeah. like that. I know that when Lane did his um, plan, most recent plan for the site down here that's got the landscape yard that light up at the top of the hill there was some money if his plan had gone forward that mm -hmm. he would have had to put in the kitty for that light and i know that he hasn't gone forward his plan so he probably put yeah. money about but yeah um our sidewalk uh, payment in lieu of um, at least there's an argument that those are not assessments because it's yes. the applicant's choice yes to do that yeah um, but so that, that hasn't necessarily been tackled either. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the latest news of, with the law. I'll let Jeff talk about the, the sessions he went to. And, yeah. Well, um, it turns out it was a good time for me to take it, since I've only I've only had one meeting here. Um, I I went to the uh, basics for planning boards. So what I heard was a lot about uh, the structure of the planning board, the RSAs that back it up, and all the the. the all the organizations that you had to put together for it. Um, uh, um, the attorney Daniel Crean was the one who gave the presentation, and he did a really good job of doing that. Um, so that was that was good, and also pretty much followed one of the documents I'm reading now, the um, new, uh, planning board for New Hampshire. It, turned, it, it followed that pretty well, so it was sort of a double. The other one I well I took two other ones. The other one I took was remembering the master plan since, in fact, I was involved in the master plan. That, 
that, that was pretty interesting. I guess the, the big takeaway for that one, that one came just after lunch when everybody was uh, very full. And June Harmon Rowan was a very good present presenter and she kept us all, all awake. Um, the big takeaway was well, you did the master plan, now use it. That's the, that was the bottom line, which you got all done. The last one I took was um, the codes, building fire and energy. And unfortunately, that one wasn't a good one for me. That one was way over my head. Um, but there were a lot of people that gained a lot from it. The people who were deeply involved in those kinds of problems really got a lot out of it. So it was, a, it was good for some people. Anyway, I did bring back my folder. It has a lot of handouts, so anyone who wants to look at it can have this. So. Thank you, so, Jeff. Thank you. Does anybody have questions for Nelson or Jeff about their experience? Um, it's been a couple of years since I've gone to one of these and they come around every year, the town pays for them. Um, they're well worth going to. The reason that I haven't been able to go is that they've been, up until this year, offered on the same weekend that I have to teach at NHTI, otherwise I would have gone to these. And this year I thought I was on the same date, so I didn't register, and it turns out that teaching is the coming weekend instead of last weekend. But. Um, they're, they're well worth it, and it's also a yes. um, good bunch of folks to hang out with. Yeah. Yeah. You meet people on other planning boards. Yeah. I even sort of hung out with uh, you know, Tony Pellegrino on our zoning board and some folks <laughs> at, at one of these. And um, uh, when you meet other people on planning boards and you hear the issues that are hot in their town, sometimes you find ones that just doesn't have anything, doesn't even hit the radar screen for us. Yeah. And mm -hmm. for them, it's just the obsession. Yeah. And you sort of realize, well, you know, you can give them a little bit of advice that untangles their issue. and they have something to say about something you're working on. Yeah. So it's good networking to do. Soapbox over. Um, anything else? On yeah, yeah. Could, I, could I bring this back to, one, in fact, one question on the last agenda item? Okay. On the um, yeah, on, yeah, on the Wilson Hill. Um, if they decided not to go forward with this development, does the town have a problem right now with those homes? I mean, they can go out and check to see if they have arsenic in their water. And if they do, do we have a problem here? The town doesn't have any obligations to make sure a private home that exists continues to have water or has water in the first place. The developer, or you know, if, it, if their statute of limitations hasn't run since the house was originally built by a developer who may have made some commitments, there may be some action there. But you know, Mike's home, Nelson's home is 200 years old or something. Yeah, mine doesn't count. <laughs> yeah. If yeah. Nelson had a problem and was unable to get water um, through any other solution, whether Nelson would have to truck in water and have some kind of a holding tank for it to make it potable for his use or whether his home was just uninhabitable. I don't know if a home it becomes um, condemnable if it doesn't have water services, mm -hmm. uninhabitable. Um, but there isn't any liability to the town to go run a water pipe up Wilson Hill Road. Yeah, I wasn't that. actually thinking liability. I mean, do we have a responsibility? I think it's what I'm really asking. Um, yeah. Can I interject, Mr. Chairman, having lived on, a, on a, a well system when I lived in Bedford, the answer is no. I mean, we, we insisted that the, the water was checked by just about every known thing before we bought the house. And when we sold it, the same issue applied, that he pretend, the p purchaser had everything done for radon, arsenic, I don't know what else they had checked, but basically we actually had paid when we after moving in we actually put in a water treatment plant in in the house ourselves to make certain it was safe but i mean legally as far as i know because i didn't i was new i just come from the other side of the water and i actually took legal advice on it and the answer is you you as a you know buyer beware and whatever it is and that's as, as yeah. i was told yeah. legal. So I, i'm not saying i know for certain but that I took advice on it because I'd never, I'd never lived on, on a well water before, and I, I went to a lot of trouble to find out. Another well, place where that same concept comes up is if there's a development that, for example, undertakes blasting. Home Depot, when it was built, had an issue with the effect that the blasting had on wells, and um, there is a reflexive reaction to suggest that somehow because the planning board approved a project that the town is responsible if blasting causes these problems. That municipal liability isn't there, but Home Depot is responsible for the effect of its actions. 
but the notion that the town is responsible if a road doesn't work the way that you thought it would or a sidewalk doesn't work the way you thought it would or a development has an impact like these folks who say who's going to help me if my water if my well dries up if we approve that subdivision and it causes those wells to dry up that's going to be a private matter between those folks and as a planning board member I would say I'm concerned about what we did in terms of making a smart decision but there's no liability for the town to come and solve that problem because the planning board approved a subdivision that had an uh, unintended consequence well I think we have a, an obligation to do due diligence and be assured ourselves that this is going to be all right I think uh, I was serious about that water study and and some hydrologists who can look at that and if they come up and say look you know everybody's going to have to go down 1500 feet to maybe find water I think I think we have a, a just cause to deny that subdivision that's my opinion I, it's it, not backed up by any yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I, if there is no water available I think that we've got an opportunity to deny the subdivision yeah. if there's water available 1500 feet or 2000 feet or whatever if the, if the property owner can in an engineering way overcome that challenge then they vote then they've met the standard there's water available what they have to do to get there is sort of up to them and if it's you know uneconomical to develop these lots because you have $25,000 wells that may be a different answer um, but I, I don't disagree with your viewpoint to say we want to get those studies done I'd like to maybe even think about if it's not in our standards putting something like that in our standards because to Jeff's point our opportunity to do something about this before the problem comes up yeah. we're the only gate we're, yeah. we're the only yeah. opportunity to do that um, if we don't do that then you know 25 years from now or 50 years from now when some wells don't do what everybody thought they were going to do um, a homeowner living nearby there with a $25,000 problem or a $30,000 problem or a problem that can't be solved with a well of any depth um, there's no good solution for that not by the planning board not by the applicant not by the builder not by anybody and so it's better to catch that before it gets through than to say well you know they'll sort it out that said of course exactly what I said before if there is an engineering solution for it no matter how difficult the applicants met his engineering requirement well I think we've heard some testimony that says it is difficult and I think it's incumbent upon him to convince me that it isn't that he can provide the water that's I, what I think uh, yeah I agree with that um, yeah. I don't know enough about how wells work in the hydrogeology to say that putting a well near somebody else's well is going to impact the flow in the in the different wells I, obviously with the large groundwater withdrawals like the town's yeah. wells you're yeah. you are pulling down the water table yeah. whether somebody's private well 600 feet away can affect the volume in your well or not may be the case it, or may not be it, I just it could or could not depend upon well, yeah, yeah, on the yeah 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 um, and so there may be answers that a study like this can produce that will help the neighbor and the neighbors aren't really going to feel comfortable until it's built and their water works um, until that happens but of course they don't want to get there they, <laughs> they, they don't want to have that problem come up so it's sort of a, but what's that yeah it doesn't work now yeah, yeah that's yeah. the thing when, when their water barely works what happened how can you not sympathize for these people that have put a ton of money into their stuff so I don't know whether I know that there isn't any room in our regulations to have the developer bond against the potential to do damage to these people's property um, from a legal standpoint if you caused an impact on your neighbor's ability I'd certainly invite that person to come sit in my office for a while. <laughs> yeah, but typically they want somebody else to pay for it. What's that? Typically they want somebody else to pay for it, not them, by taking it private. Yeah, yeah, no question. Um, and I don't know, I mean, there very well could be a solution that there's some kind of a well that could be drilled for these 11 lots. Um, and I, at some depth into some aquifer that actually could supply the water to these other houses as well and put them on sort of a mini little community system and maybe there's no water there that could come anywhere close to that who knows but it's been done before yeah I was the superintendent of a water system for three weeks 
<laughs> you don't want to do that. <laughs> no, you don't want to do that. But anyway. But it has been done. Yes. Are there, other than the OEP and the and just question about the previous applicant, other item discussion or possible action regarding other items of concern? Mike. Um, and apologies for my absence, but where are we with the um, discussion regarding the soils, Pete's interests, and uh, the efforts yeah. to try well, to bring that forward to a regulation? Can, can I perhaps, Mr. Chairman, answer that one for you? Um, Pete was unable to attend the meeting that we'd planned to have, which was the last meeting. Um, and then subsequent to that, Pete uh, asked to have a meeting with Tim Thompson, which I set up for Wednesday of last week, which was can Tim had to cancel. Uh, Pete, Pete had to cancel at the, the, the 11th hour and the 59th minute. Um, his medical situation at the present is not good. Um, and obviously, I will take this opportunity behalf of us all to wish him well. He certainly is having a series of issues with his health, which are being attended to by the medical profession. And I'm keeping in touch with him. And we have agreed that subject to um, getting himself a little better, he's, he will reset, we will reset that meeting with uh, him and Tim, which I was sort of being the umpire in. Um, and we'll, having got that meeting on, then he will come to this meet, this board with his, the papers once he's sort of had a time in the session with Tim and us how to present it. Okay. So in the works, but a little stumbling. Mm. And let me echo Alistair's wishes for Pete's health, obviously. Any other discussion and possible action regarding other items of concern? Hearing none, uh, the next item on our agenda is the approval of the minutes of April 21st, 2015. I, I move to um, approve the minutes with uh, comments, some comments that I have to it. What are your comments? Uh, one of them, I'm going to start off with a, with a question. On page two, um, line five, the, the comment says, Chairman Best noted that the barrels blocking the south end of the road are pushed to the side whenever Michael Miaggio feels like using the road. Um, is that what you meant? Is that what should be on record? Well, it may have been what I said, but obviously I'm not there to watch the barrels pushed to the side of the road. There are tire tracks running over, around, and through where those barrels are sitting to suggest that cars have gone up and down that road and not been impeded by the barrels. Um, whether Mr. Maggio did that or somebody else, um, I don't know, and I certainly didn't observe it. Um, Zana, does that provide you with a general information that might allow an edit? I would just yeah. take out the word Michael Maggio and put whenever someone feels yep. like yep. reading. I was going to suggest that. Perfect. Yep. Yeah. Thank yep. you, Zana, and thank you, Desiree, for seeing that. All right. And then uh, a few more comments here. Page three, uh, line four. A little more clarification here. So we have, uh, I think, so. Uh, so he he wants more width, even with a two foot high wall. I wanted to clarify and say he wants more width at the bottom, even with a two foot high wall, because he's referring to additional width at the bottom of the retaining wall mm -hmm. for maintaining. So just if we could say at the bottom, that would make it more clear. Uh, line seven, same page. Uh, that section of the sidewalk uh, is not absolutely warranted. The school connection is. I wanted to clarify and say that section of the sidewalk at Old Blood Road is not absolutely warranted. However, the school connection is. I, I'm fine with that edit, although I would like to add a second edit to that sentence to figure out who's making that statement. Who's responsible for that sentence? Whether that was the opinion of. Um, I think it's Kyle. Whether it was Kyle, whether it was um, Ken Clinton, Ken Clinton, or one member of the board who had suggested that. I think it's got to be Ken because it goes on the sidewalk waiver is the only new waiver request, so it's got to be Ken Clinton. Perfect. I w I would argue that it, it potentially could even be uh, our general agreement that because basically came to the assumption that that wasn't necessary. Sure. That connection wasn't necessary, but the school absolutely was. That's a good I point. think with respect to that, that kind of sort of comes up when we get to voting and we grant the waiver, but okay. uh, or uh -huh. at least we suggest that we would grant the waiver if it was presented to us. Um, but in this section of the minutes, 
that appears to be someone's expression of an opinion, and I just <laughs> like opinions to. <coughs> okay. So Zaina is Kyle. suggesting that it was Kyle. Yeah. I'm fine with that too. I don't. I mean, yeah. Kyle wasn't here, so Ken was speaking for Kyle. Yeah. But I'll take Kyle. <coughs> All right. Uh, next comment down on line 30 of the same page. Um, so second par second sentence in that line. Uh, he does not know who will design the homes. This was my question to him where I was asking him. So I wanted to say Desiree asked if the homes would be custom or if uh, they would be track style homes. And then uh, we, he could say he does, he does not know the builder or the home design okay. following that. So you want to add a sentence between the first sentence and the second sentence saying Desiree or what? member fault? Uh, yeah, De well, member fault asked. Uh, if the homes, yeah, I guess a paragraph in front and say he does not know. Yeah, yes, that's correct. Add a sentence in front, specifying that I asked the question. Okay. And um, then I have one other real tiny little comment here on page six, uh, line 19. Um, I'll actually start on 18 just to read the sentence. Uh, Tom Jokers, general manager, said Anheuser-Busch uses Pinachuk water rather than well water for consistency across all 12 Anheuser-Busch plants. Probably should say uh, Tom Jokers, general manager, Anheuser-Busch uses Pinachuk water rather than well water, comma, or period, and say they monitor water for consistency across all 12 Anheuser-Busch plants, period. Okay. Break that to separate. Okay. They're not using Pinachuk for all their plants. Yeah, no. Be a lot of reach for Penichuk. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Is there a second for Desiree's motion with the uh, proposed changes? I make a second. Second, it, Mr. Chairman. I'd also just ask on same page six, line seventeen. It starts. Nelson Disco asked how close. I didn't understand what that meant. Hmm. It doesn't seem to relate to anything. I was asking about the distance between the oh, infiltration. Oh, I see. Yeah, I, I get you. And the wells. Yeah, I That's think it should be the sentence could be expanded to say how close the wells were going to be, or something. Yeah, how close would the wells were to the infiltration, infiltration system? I think you asked what you yeah. asked. That's what I was asking. Yeah, well, yeah. I think it could be made clear yeah. in the sentence that yeah. that's what they. Otherwise, Mr. Chairman, I didn't have any other points. Does anyone else have any other changes to minutes? Seeing none, all in favor of approving the minutes as amended, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Two abstaining. Um, Mike and Councillor Mahan um, are abstaining. So that is 502 to approve the minutes. That brings us to item 7 on our agenda, which is to adjourn. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to adjourn. Second by Me. Desiree. <laughs> all in favor, say aye. 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 Any Aye. opposed? Any abstaining? 700, we're adjourned. Um, thank you, everyone, and don't forget to turn your microphone off.